Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, a program that brings community leaders together for thoughtful discussions around issues that impact our community, our country, and yes, our world. I'm Vicki Cayetano, your host today, and I have the pleasure of hosting our discussion around the subject of the challenges facing our nonprofits today. How can nonprofits survive and even thrive? With me are esteemed guests, Amy Iwano, President and CEO of Your Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, and Jennifer Oyer of Community Impact Advisors. Thank you so much for joining us today. In the next 30 minutes or so, we are going to have a productive and informative discussion about nonprofits in the state of Hawaii. But let's start with some numbers that I have. You know that there are more than 10,000 nonprofit organizations registered with the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. The IRS lists 9,153 active tax exempt organizations that operate in our state, including 7,890 to which you can make a tax deductible donation because they are 501c3s as we call them. Amy, can I start with you? I mean, you've had a long and illustrious career on the mainland in the music world. Uh, I know you come from New Mexico, Chicago, LA. What do you think as a first impression of the number of nonprofits that we have in Hawaii? Are they more than what you're used to seeing? What do you think? Uh, those numbers are truly breathtaking for a state the size of Hawaii. And it just shows, uh, it shows to me two different things. It shows how uh, the community is really participating in supporting all of the needs of um, of people here in the state. Um, but it also shows that as someone who's working for a not-for-profit organization, how competitive it really is. Um, and of course, there are the various sectors. I've always worked in the performing arts and um, that of course pr uh, poses its own challenges uh, in terms of um, raising money, attracting audiences, uh, mm -hmm. getting participation. Um, but I think what is heartening is the number of not-for-profits shows that there's so many people who believe and are getting involved. That's great. Jen, you are a professional development consultant. Uh, do you know the breakdown? Like how many of these organizations, these 8,000 plus or so that are registered 501c3s, how many of them are like faith-based or just uh, smaller operations? And of course, there are some very large ones, uh, many of them centered now around supporting Maui. What, what does the, the number tell you? Uh, well, I actually don't know the actual breakdown um, based on sector, but what the numbers tell me is that, well, as Amy mentioned, it is it is truly staggering that there are so many nonprofits. And my question to the nonprofits would be, uh, because the competition is so is so large here in Hawaii, how are you going to allow your nonprofit to stand out? What types of storytelling are you going to be doing to ensure that you're communicating your mission with your donors and how are you getting your donors involved in your mission? So, um, yeah, it's it that that is a big number. It also makes me think, too, though, how can nonprofits partner together? And, uh, you know, a lot of foundations, um, that's one of the questions that they ask. They know that there are so many nonprofits out there. Some foundations ask, you know, there is a non, another nonprofit very doing very similar work. Have you thought about partnering with mm -hmm. them and joining forces? So I think that this is a larger discussion when it comes mm -hmm. to effective nonprofit. That's a good point because, you know, optimizing your services so that much of the money that people donate should go to the true cause, the mission, not to overhead, you know, not to the administrative costs. I think that's a very uh, worthwhile point to discuss for the benefit of generous donors. Uh, and so, you know, why aren't some nonprofits looking at sharing back of the house services? Is it because it's 
territorial, frankly. Uh, the other question I would want to ask is, how much oversight is there of these nonprofits? How easy is it to form a nonprofit? And then what is the regulatory oversight to ensure that the donors who make these generous contributions uh, are seeing that their money is well spent? Do you know, is there a, a state law or regulatory process that oversees them? Yes, there is actually, uh, you know, nonprofits need to be uh, registered every year and ensure that all of their tax information is updated um, through the state of Hawaii. Uh, but it makes me think about, you know, transparency. How transparent are these nonprofits when it comes to sharing information about the work, the work and the impact that they're making? I think that's how uh, nonprofits can stay relevant and also generate additional donor dollars to support their mission when they're able to communicate effectively the work that they're doing throughout the state. Amy, I know that uh, the symphony files a 990 uh, every year. Is that required of all nonprofits, regardless of the size of the nonprofit? I believe it is. Um, or maybe it's for uh, not-for-profits with budgets of above 350000 That threshold may have gone up, um, but it's either 350000 maybe 500000 um, Organizations with those budgets are required to file a 990 as well as submit an audit when they're seeking grants. And I would just have to say, um, piggybacking on Jen's comments, um, not-for-profits are really under a lot of scrutiny to use their resources well. Um, and I feel that the not-for-profits that I'm familiar with are um, really take that responsibility seriously. Uh, we produce annual reports to share what we've done with our donors and with people who are thinking about donating. We understand that um, individuals also want to know that their dollars are being spent well, but that other donors such as foundations and corporations report to their boards of directors and want to make sure that um, their, their donations are being spent um, according to their missions as well. So I think the takeaway from this is that it's great to be generous, but donors should not hesitate to ask for information uh, that uh, you know, all organizations uh, should be filing and uh, being responsible for. I'd like to shift a little bit uh, to the changing landscape of donors. Um, you know, are donors today as generous, the next generation? Are they as generous as their uh, fathers and grandmothers uh, before. And uh, I was reading an article in the New York Times about San Francisco and about the Getty family and how philanthropic they have been to the city. Um, and now as the next generation is is coming on board, are they getting involved? Tell me uh, some, share with me some of your thoughts, uh, Jen, about how you see uh, generosity and the changing landscape uh, with the next generation, if you would, please. The good news uh, in some way is that uh, according to Giving USA, which is a national organization that surveys the landscape of philanthropy nationally, uh, giving has gone up. So there has been over $557 billion given to nonprofits across the U.S. Um, but that is uh, that number has increased because of inflation and takes inflation into account. Uh, we are seeing less donors giving fewer dollars. So that's because, you know, as the baby boomers and, you know, that generation is getting older, uh, they aren't necessarily teaching the younger generation about philanthropy. And so I think we need to do a better job in getting the younger generation involved in things like volunteerism so that they're able to get their hands dirty and involved, like seeing, feeling, touching, and experiencing mm -hmm. the joy that comes with philanthropy. And I think that that's one of the things that nonprofits can focus on when working with the younger generation um, and getting them involved so that they can then move to uh, giving philanthropic dollars. Yeah, because in some ways, uh, there have never been as many millionaires and billionaires as you see today. 
And, and uh, so as you have stated, we need to make sure that next generation, and I'm saying this to myself, that we teach that to our children, uh, because I think all around us, you're bombarded with, you know, um, ads and things about get what you want, do it now, get it now. You know, it's we're rearing, raising a generation of kids that tend to think more about themselves than about others. And uh, I think that's a very good point. Amy, you want to lend some thoughts about that as you look at your, at your patrons and are they the same mix or are mostly the young people falling off? Sure. Of course, there's been a lot of discussion about this very subject in the performing arts and uh just naturally children are going to want to do something different from what their parents did. So um, in the performing arts, there has not necessarily been that um, passing of values of, of philanthropy um, from the generation that is older now and has been so generous. Um, but we, again, I'm coming from the world of the performing arts. So I'm speaking from, uh, from that perspective. Um, the performing arts are a little bit different because they're a really a, a local organization that has to be experienced in order for a potential donor to understand the aesthetic and to, you know, to feel the art. Um, it's not something that's more general, like um, supporting a, an, an an illness or supporting um, children. Uh, so that's one of the challenges that the performing arts has. One thing that uh, I wanted to emphasize actually is that everybody wants community. Everybody uh, is seeking a community for where they feel connected, where they feel comfortable. Um, and I think that is something that we can look at changing, at least within mm -hmm. the HSO, for example. Our programming is really wide. It, you know, orchestras used to be only about classical music. And here at HSO, our programming appeals to everyone. There's something for um, for classical music lovers, but we also offer films in concert. We offer the music of Studio Ghibli. This season, we're offering music of video games. And, you know, so you're those... trying to appeal to a younger group as well. Yes. Yeah, so... and I see other performing arts organizations really trying to do that as well. But shifting from that, do you find that, uh, Jen, that the next group of uh, philanthropists, shall we say, are more focused on issues that impact environment? You know, you've got health care, you've got education, the children's needs, you've got environmental issues with climate change. Is that becoming a bigger and bigger focus now, you think? This is my consultant answer. I think it depends. Um, but Yes, I mean, you know, some of the local foundations that we're working with um, now, uh, they express to us that their priorities are shifting. And so I think it's just a matter of taking the time to meet with the funders and get to uh, have the ability to learn about what those priorities are. Yes, um, one, there's one local foundation that expressed to us that they were interested in actually in climate change and the environment and the local landscape, when in the past, they've been funding so much of arts and culture, for example. So that was really surprising to me. And that's because that's what the kids um, on the board or the children of the founders, um, that's what their interests are. So as the generation changes, as the generations change, the focus, the priorities of the foundations will change too, I think. And we're starting to see that here in Hawaii. Do you find that uh, health and education continue to, and faith-based organizations continue to be the dominant in terms of raising money, those organizations? I think so. And education um, is always um, at the top of the list. You know, people want to ensure that our education system is uh, strong and uh, our university is strong. Uh, but yes, healthcare is always, um, I think, top of mind. Um, and also animal welfare, um, giving an animal welfare has been going up too. That's so it. it's just a matter of how are you going to allow your nonprofit to stand out through the storytelling that you share with your donors? Storytelling and I think finding uh, the the mm -hmm. type of donor who, you know, the, whose passion is in line with what you're 
promoting or you're part of. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, and I think that there are some creative ways uh, to help for nonprofits to thrive in terms of raising money. The one-to-one point of contact is always great, but you have to really think out of the box. And my grandson who goes to a public school just started school in September and already we've been hit with two fundraisers both in buying you know pizza chinese food now next week and they designate a certain percentage you know to that school uh before it was maybe once or twice a year now in one month alone we already got hit twice so as i told my family you're having pizza and chinese food for the month of september <laughs> but i think those are clever ways that they're partnering up to create another source of funding, shall we say, besides the point of contact and asking for donations. Um, are there other ways uh, that the symphony is trying to raise money or other nonprofits, Jen, to be creative about, you know, surviving and even thriving in today's world? Well, I think Amy can talk a little bit more about this, but um, as a consultant and having the opportunity to see the work of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, uh, I think they do such an amazing job in connecting the donor's passion to the needs of the organization. And Amy and the board members have um, are able to uh, meet face to face with the donors and ask them, what are your interests? What are your passions? And how can we make uh, your passion come to life through the symphony, uh, through opportunities that we have, like naming opportunities? Uh, I think the main thing to remember for nonprofits is, again, how can you connect the donor's passion to the needs of the organization? We know that giving comes from the majority of giving comes from individuals. It's not from foundations and it's not from corporations. So how are you building meaningful relationships with your donors? And HSO does a really great job at that. One of the ways that we do is through storytelling. And, uh, you know, what is really the most important thing for not-for-profit organizations is to always hold out your mission um, in front of you and, and connect those stories to the mission. And I think I agree that HSO does that really well. Um, our mission is being held out for us by our relatively new music director, Dane Lamb. He's only been with us for one year, but he has really captured the imagination of everybody. And so uh, one of our fundraising efforts recently was thanks to Vicky's idea to celebrate Dane's one year anniversary. And we had such a wonderful outpouring of support um, when we asked people to write a note to Dane to congratulate him on his anniversary and to express their thanks for him being here as our music director. Uh, so we got both messages and uh, gifts from the public because of that. So that's a great example of an individual having that kind of magnetism and impact. I would like to bring up an example of one though, uh, and it's our University of Hawaii. Jay Scheidler and the impact that he's made. Scheidler College of Business, uh, which also now includes the Travel Industry Management School, but the overall impact on our entire university. And if you think about it, there's not really one person, I think, that brought Jay Scheidler in. Uh, but what was it that made him uh, make such a generous contribution, really impactful to our community? And, you know, not only to applaud him and thank him for that, but it would be very interesting to know the dynamics uh, behind that decision. Um, you know, I, I think very highly of President Lassner, but I'm not sure that it was around one person that made that, you know, that attracted his generosity. But that's a very interesting example to me of how it really boosted the university. And now they're one billion dollar uh, drive. Do we know where they're at right now with that? Someone told me they're like half of it already they've raised. And I know that it's a it's over a 10 year, it's a 10 year one billion dollar campaign. So it's it's a big one. When I was working at UH Foundation, uh our campaign was $250 million. And that's when Jay made his initial $25 million gift. But I really think it's it was due to the vision that the dean was able to cast 
for Jay. Like, imagine what Hawaii would look like if we had a top-notch business school and the amazing uh, professors that we could bring in. So just uh, what Vance what Dean Rowley was able to cast, I think the vision for Jay, um, mm -hmm. that got him excited. And he that's how he made his initial gift. Uh, just gives me chicken skin just thinking about that initial $25 million gift. Um, but that's what nonprofits need to do. They need to be able to cast an, a vision for to the donor of the impact that their philanthropy can make on the organization. That's a very good point. So a shout out to Dean Rowley <laughs> for doing that. But I think you just nailed it on the head that leaders of nonprofits need to be able to have that vision, but also to communicate that narrative to donors to inspire them so that they will dig deep and make meaningful, impactful gifts like what Mr. Scheidler has done for our community. Let me ask you one more thing, both of you. Hawaii has a number of residents who are not here full time, but they have nice homes. Uh, they buy a lot of land and they're on usually on the neighbor island. How do we get more of them who do like this place? That's why they've you know, decided to spend part of the time here. But how do we get them to feel more vested in our community. How, how do we do that? That's a hard one. We have to find them first. We have to find a connection um, and just figure out how to get in front of them and, and tell our story. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with board members and because it's all about relationships, right? Um, and I think board members and who you have on your board plays a big part in um, getting those large donations. So for example, on Maui, I'm working with a client who was able to get a meaningful transformational gift from Jeff Bezos. And that was because of one of their board members who had a relationship with him. Um, you know, oftentimes organizations say, oh, let's uh, go after Oprah Winfrey because she has, you know, land uh, here in Hawaii. She'll give us money. It's not like that. It's because of personal connections and relationships that are built. So I think who you have on your board is really important. Um, and I think nonprofits often forget about how impactful board members can be. <laughs> Get your foot in the door, create the narrative and the vision. And uh, really, I think that's a, that's, a tall order because many of them do come here, maybe spend three, four months, see it as a rest and recreation kind of stay. Um, oftentimes very private. They don't even go out into the community. You know, they cherish that about Hawaii. And yet, how do we get them to feel part of our community without invading that part of it? I think that I think it can be done. You've seen the Benioffs and their generosity. Mm -hmm. you know, to the healthcare systems. Hilo Medical certainly needed that. That's in their backyard. So that's great for them. Uh, but there are others that, that I think we need to seek out without forgetting uh, our locals, because this is their community. This is for them. So, you know, any kind of uh, sharing thoughts as we start to wrap down this program, I'd very much appreciate in your minds, what are the top two or three challenges for nonprofits? And then I also would like to share what are the two or three ideas that you think could help them? It will make the difference between their survival uh, existence, survive, and then the difference to thrive. Um, what are your thoughts on that, given all the experience you've had in fundraising and in supporting nonprofits? Amy, you want to take a go sure, at it? Sure, sure. One, uh, one thing that I would say is look for collaboration. There are so many ways that we can benefit each other. And uh, within the performing arts, that doesn't mean just collaboration with other arts organizations. We love our partnerships with Hawaii Opera Theater and the uh, Hawaii Theater Center and the ballet. And But we're also looking at uh, non-cultural organizations to work with as well. Um, you know, we mentioned uh, that 
younger people may be more interested in supporting environmental causes. Well, there are themes that we can uh, program um, where we can work with other groups. And, and that just gives more people a way into what we're doing. It gets us in front of a more audience, uh, a bigger audience, and it allows us to share resources with other organizations. And I think everybody benefits, you know, rising tide raises all ships. Jen? Uh, I think for me, two things. One is, well, my favorite quote is by Hank Rosso, and it's fundraising is the gentle art of teaching the joy of giving. Fundraising is a gentle art of teaching the joy of giving. So I encourage nonprofits to think about how they can teach uh, their donors what the joy of giving is tangible opportunities, donor experiences that they can provide so that their donors can see, feel, touch, and experience um, the joy that comes with philanthropy. And then the second thing I think uh, would be nonprofits should really focus on retaining their donors. Oftentimes, donor uh, nonprofits want to acquire new donors, but really your largest donors are already going to come from your donor database. They're already connected to you. And so you just need to find opportunities to build those meaningful relationships with the donors that are already in your donor database. So focus on retention. That's a good point, because when I look at like my kids and the schools that they go to, uh, almost every fundraising effort they do is like creating a new group, you know, attracting uh, a, a, a drive to raise money. But when you think about it, it would probably be very useful for them to go back to the same people that had helped them before and to engage them more. You know, but uh, I want to thank you both for being on the show today, for sharing uh, your wisdom and your experience. You know, I would close by just saying how important these uh, nonprofit organizations are to our community. If we don't have them, think about who is going to have to pick up this, you know, that service to them. It's certainly not government. Government has nowhere the creativity or the ability to have the same kind of resources and would be much more costly and, frankly, I think much less uh, efficiently done. So I think it behooves all of us uh, and to all of our viewers to remember the great work that nonprofits do in every category, whether it's performing arts, education, healthcare, uh, listening to public radio, listening to think tech. How does think tech survive without support? You know, we need to have a platform where we can have meaningful, objective discussions like this. And so to you both and to all of our viewers, thank you for joining me today. I'm Vicki Cayetano from Think Tech Hawaii and all of us. Mahalo and aloha.